All right. Well, we're joined this evening by Tom Best, our own member, which is fantastic. Tom joined Sabre within the last five years to further improve his research into this book project. He's a retired seventh grade social studies teacher and college professor who taught a variety of courses ranging from using primary sources to teach the Civil War to the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. He's a diehard baseball fan. His interest in minor league and major league baseball was born of his love in the St. Louis Cardinals in the mid 60s. He has written widely on a variety of historical topics, but this book project regarding Monmouth baseball had been his most extensive research mission. Tom, take it away. Okay, well, thank you very much. It's kind of interesting. I'm just wrapping up things in the next couple of days and the book's going to the publisher probably by Friday. So uh, my goal was we we would have all this done and we'd be off on our trip to the eclipse uh, by next <laughs> week. And so perfect timing. Well, the presentation tonight, as you can see, Tales from the Diamond, that's what's going to title of the book. And in the lower left-hand corner, you see a little card that I had put together. And actually, I had put those together for the uh, Sabre convention last year. It was very helpful. So it's really the history of Mammoth baseball throughout this time period. And I'll just point out to the left there, you can see a couple of letters. This is one of the things I found when I went to Cooperstown, and it's a letter by one of the guys who played for the Monmouth Browns, and his name was Hosea Siner, and he eventually went on to play a little bit of Major League Baseball, but, but not very much. So let's, let's find out about tonight. Well, first of all, where did the motivation for all this come from? Well, probably the, the starting point for all this was a young man that I was good friends with. We were probably about six, seven years old. And uh, you can see where my inspiration for a Cardinal fan came from. His name was Stan Musial Sturts. And Stan and I used to play baseball all the time. Uh, and his dad was kind of an invalid, but he loved Cardinal baseball. And so we could come into the house to listen to the Cardinal games on the radio. But if we got noisy at all, he sent us out. So we, we learned to be quiet and listening. So probably 64, 1964 is when I really started paying attention to the Cardinals. A good year to start, right? Uh, beyond there, uh, on to uh, teaching and college career. I love doing historical research. I did research and everything from Abraham Lincoln to the Oregon Trail. And then the picture you see there, Lonesome Charlie, is a guy named Lonesome Charlie Reynolds. I've done a lot of research on him. Um, he bears the uh, recognition of being uh, George Armstrong Tuster's chief civilian scout. He died out the Battle of the Bighorn. Uh, and then you see a picture there toward the middle, and you see Harry Welch. Uh, a dear friend of mine by the name of Bill Anderson, who just recently passed away far too long before his time, had an interest in local history and baseball like I did. And one day he said, I have something I want to show you. And it was this particular card. And it says Welsh. You can see second base there, uh, 1912 Monmouth Browns, fourth place, the Central Association. Well, I got interested in that and tried to find out what I could. And then one day I was talking to another friend by the name of Jeff Rankin. He's a a uh, friend and local historian. And he said he'd heard about the Browns before. And I said, well, what do you know about it? And he said, well, I know that the Chicago Cubs came to town, to Monmouth, and played them twice in 1909 and 1910. Now, at first I was incredulous. I thought, well, you're just pulling my leg, right? Because he's a big Cubs fan. So I thought he's just, you know, he's it's like April Fool's Day, right? He says, no, you look it up, you find out. And that's where it really began. Um, as you could well expect, he used a lot of primary sources. Newspapers were probably the biggest source that I used all the way along. I used a lot of really great books. George uh, Kirsch's book, Baseball in Blue and Gray, talks about baseball in the Civil War era, the Ken Burns series. And then I really couldn't have done this in some ways without the inspiration of Robert Sampson. I think we had Robert on one time, didn't we? And he's been at one. I know when he was there when we were at the um, uh, Bloomington ball game. And... Uh, and Robert, uh, really an inspiration and encouraged me to keep going all this. And his book, Ball is Dead Beats and Muffins. And if you've not read this book, you really should. By the way, muffins refers to uh, fun games that people played were really not intending to try to, uh, to win necessarily, but just to have fun and often to raise money. And then there's just a score of books like Richard uh, Hirschberger's book, Strike for the Evolution of Baseball. I don't know how many people have read it, but if you want to find out about the little early history of the game, there's, there's where you go. So from there, I started thinking, well, what's really the, the purpose behind this quest? And, and it's really this. What was the long-term legacy of baseball in Monmouth dating to the era of the Civil War and into the early 1900s? And what I found was that playing and watching baseball in the, er, in the late 19th century to early 20th century 
was really kind of a recreational glue, which bound together daily life for people in that era. In this time period, Monmouth had teams called the Clippers, the White Stockings, the Athletics, the Maple Cities, and then the Browns. And there were a lot of other smaller ones behind that. But what really excited me about this whole project was this thought, that these teams formed a catalyst to economic growth. And they were really a vehicle to civic pride. And as they so often said over and over again, this was to put Monmouth on the map. So it was not just baseball and recreation. It really had social and economic overtones as well. Probably the earliest baseball that was being played in this time period uh, was on sections just like the, the downtown square. It was really kind of a prairie. And they used to throw a home plate, as they said, down on one side of the square. They'd grab a bat and they'd go play. Enough baseball was being played around town that by 1868, a local ordinance was actually passed that said you could not play baseball in the square or on public streets. Uh, and they also, interestingly, uh, put down restrictions on um, football and croquet. I thought, I don't know where these croquet balls are going, but uh, at least the baseballs might be gone through windows from time to time. By the era of the Civil War, a lot of these men that may have learned something about baseball headed off for the fields of battle. And some of them probably picked up some understanding of baseball while they were out playing as well. I bet some of you have probably seen this famous lithograph here of a Yankee prison camp where they're playing baseball there. They also picked up books at the times like Beatles Dime Baseball Player. And they probably stuffed this into their haversack as they marched off to battle. But the real organized part of baseball in Monmouth came about with Monmouth College. They were playing in an area known as the North Prairie, and we're still searching to this day to know exactly where that was. But in 1867, they started putting together some teams. There was a team called the Classic, another one, the Charter Oak, and one called the Resolute. By 1868, they started playing home and away series against nearby Galesburg's Lombard College. Lombard College is probably best known as the place where um, Carl Sandburg went to school. Lombard no longer exists. And in that year, of 1868, Monmouth played a game with Lombard and they beat them 74 to 27. Now, if you know anything about baseball in there, you know they had these really high scoring games. Uh, the, the loss of Lombard was blamed, as they said, on the lack of strategic guidance by their manager. Um, I think that's kind of a nice way of saying he didn't know what the hell he was doing. Uh, but Monmouth also suffered some as well. The paper talked about their careless play and quote, wild throws and lazy bats. I love that particular one. By 1869, Monmouth had two other teams on campus, probably kind of an intramural program. The reserves were the upperclassmen, and the stick tights were the freshmen and sophomores. In 1882, they joined what was called the Intercollegiate Baseball Association and included such teams as Galesburg's Knox College, the Champaign Industrial Institute, and Illinois College. The only stain upon Monmouth in this time period is there were allegations that Monmouth had been bringing in ringers to bolster their games in this time period. And who knows? Maybe they had. In this era, uh, there's a lot of different rules and styles of play we don't have today. Uh, pitchers were called hurlers. And in that era, you had to throw the ball underhanded and you had to throw it where the batter wanted. So he could request the ball to either be thrown high, middle or low. You were not supposed to jerk the ball with your arm. And uh, even though players were starting to figure out how to kind of throw fast and slow and even sort of for the change-ups, the, the game was really dictated by the hitters. Catchers stood some 10 to 20 feet behind home plate. They didn't have all the protective gear we have today. The umpire didn't stand necessarily directly by the catcher, but could have stood to the side of the field or behind back where the pitcher was. And uh, fans in that era were known as bugs and cranks. And they didn't like what was called hippodroming. Hippodroming meant that they, the players got together and agreed what the score and what the result was going to be before they played. They hated that. And it's probably because some of them were gambling. Uh, just as a note of the style of play in that era, bunts were very popular. Uh, they called this the scientific or inside game. Bunts were called baby grounders, baby hits, little ones, and short hits. Uh, if you look at the picture here, you can also see another aspect. You see where it says a stinger? That was also called soaking. So you could throw the ball at a guy and you could get him out that way. Uh, the lemon peel ball there in the middle, probably understanding why it didn't hurt that bad because these were soft. I have one of those. And then you can see the bat looks more like a club than a bat that we would have today. One of the things I learned from Robert Sampson that I mentioned earlier is they played these muffin games. And that could have been like 
the town doctors against the attorneys, or it could have been businessmen and craftsmen and mechanics and such, or even neighborhood groups. But one of the things they really love to pull together were these games between like the fats and the corpulence, or as I often found things like the leans and the fats, they were often um, fundraising games. The first team, yeah, whoops, here we go back. There we go. The first team that Mammoth really put together in this time was called the Clippers. Game a popular name for a lot of teams in the era. And was born in 1867 out of a meeting with 55 clubs that met in Chicago. Mammoth came there probably trying to figure out how do you schedule games and how do you sign players and all these types of things. And the Clippers were a junior team. That's something that I learned from Robert. Uh, and uh, the point was that this meant that they were uh, boys and young men probably in their middle to late teens. And then seniors were the ones who were like late teens, the early 20s and so forth. Mammoth began with this Clipper team playing uh, really kind of exhibition games against the Monmouth uh, college team. But then in 1867, along came Dennis, uh, Dr. Norwood S. Woodward. He played baseball as a youth. He was involved in all aspects of Monmouth government, including the city fire company. And he really started to put this team together. In fact, he did such a good job that at one point he was hailed for, quote, having devoured every club in this section of the country who then started out in search of other victims. They won ball games by scores like 64 to 42 and one against the young America team now called the town's called Kirkwood. They won that game 92 to 35. Can you imagine setting through a game like that? But amazingly, these games would be like three hours long when they'd get these things going. By 1868, the Clippers were playing a variety of teams in the region, including a, often they were playing teams from Burlington, Iowa. And in one of these games, uh, there were six players for the Clippers that scored seven or more runs each. One of the guys scored nine. There were three inside the park home runs. So that gives you an idea of what an offensive juggernaut this team was. Uh, in 1868, they also started playing games down in Macomb, just south of us. Um, and they often attracted a large group of fans that would come down on the trains. But in 1868, later that year, there was a game between the Clippers and the Quincy Occidentals, kind of a neutral field for them. And the uh, the part that kind of got everybody buzzing, as they said, is that they found out there was betting going on in the game. Uh, no one really seemed to object to it too largely, but there were allegations afterwards that there was seeming, as they said, whitewashing of the locals' immorality. So I guess as long as you won money, you didn't care too much about that. By 1869 is when the Clippers really came into their own. They started playing teams from the suburban areas of Chicago and Chicago itself. They played a team called the Osceolas, and they beat them very convincingly, 64 to 19. They went up against a team called the Chicago Amateurs, which they played in Chicago. We don't know the result of that particular game. And then they played some others that had guys from a team that was known as the Chicago Elsiers, Excelsiors, excuse me. And they were probably some of the best ball players in the entire Midwest. Um, and then came time. They're going to go up to Chicago and they're going to play some real elite teams. Dr. Woodward got together some fundraisers. And for a combined ticket of $6.25, you could take the train and get a ticket to the game. In case you're wondering how much that was, that'd be like $136 today. Uh, but the game and the uh, event that drew the most attention was when they were going to play the Rockford Four Cities. Now, I don't know how many have ever read about this particular team. But the Rockford Four Cities would have matched up with the best teams in New York City in that in that era. And one of the reasons they were so good is that they had a little 18-year-old uh, guy by the name of Albert Spaulding. And you know him, of course, as famous uh, sports um, equipment. But he also played baseball himself at, at a major league level. In fact, he played uh, at in one particular year. He played for... Um, uh, a league that was just kind of a notch down from the majors. And in one season, he was 54 and five with seven shutouts. That tells you what he was capable of, right? Also on that team was a guy named Bob Addy, who was known to have perhaps introduced the slide to baseball. So this team that everybody had their eyes on and everybody thought they were capable of great things was going to play these Rockford Forest Cities. Well, I told you earlier how they were kind of blasting people. Well, the Forest City team won. And what was the score? 76 to one. Okay, that's the score. In the game, they said that there were 76 runs scored on three dozen balls knocked out of sight by the Rockford Sluggers. So I don't know how many home runs they hit or inside the parks, but it must have been a lot. 
the uh, Clippers decided they wanted to get some revenge for this, and they in invited the Forest City team to come back down to Monmouth later in the season to play. And this time they doubled their score. They only lost 46 to 2. But it gives you an idea of, of at least what they were hoping to do. The next year, 1870, and then on into 1871, they're playing a lot of local teams in that time period. Uh, some of the games I found were games that they played in Burlington because we had good access to the newspapers. But they played some other teams, too, in the area. Uh, and they often won. There was a game against the Olympics of uh, Sheffield, Illinois, which they won 43 to 32. Uh, they had a nail biter against the team called the Mutuals from Galvin Lafayette, and they barely won that 47 to 46. It's said that they played into 1872, but the last games I found for them were in 1871. Uh, from the 1870s to 1880s, they played a host of other teams in that time period. Now, I don't think they played this team, but I, I love this picture, the celebrated Lazy Nine. Uh, you know, I'm sure we'd like to match up against them, right? So in this era, there were some other junior teams. There was the Monmouth White Stockings, and they became the eventual champions of a Knox and Warren County League. Uh, they would play what was often called the Pick Nine, some of the best players from the area. They played the Clippers off and on, and then they played uh, teams from Galesburg, like the Knox and Lombard College team. And it's said that they won a junior championship in that time period. They also went off and played in tournaments. They played a tournament in Peoria, and they beat a nameless Peoria club 56-34, to 34, but they weren't an equal match to the Uniques of Chicago, who beat apparently a team called the Peoria Nationals 33-1. to 1. And there was a team called the Socials of Chicago. They actually won the tournament. They went off and played a tournament in Bureau County for a $250 prize. That was big money then. And I also have references to a tournament that they played in Mercer County, just next door here to Monmouth. And they actually lost in a championship game to 10 to 7. There were also teams called the Monmouth Unions and the Monmouth Brown, or excuse me, the Monmouth um, Blues. And those were probably junior teams as well. So uh, in this era, there were a lot of teams being played, uh, played in this area. This is a picture of the downtown square. Remember earlier I told you about them playing in the square? And you're probably wondering, how in the world do they do that? Well, look how big this is. Throwing down a, a home plate on the west side, you had enough room to play in that time period. The first real organized team that they had though, was the Monmouth Athletics, and this is 1889. They played an independent schedule, and then late in the season, the Davenport um, Hawkeyes decided to drop out of the Central Interstate League, and they gave uh, the Clippers, or I'm sorry, the Athletics, the opportunity to finish the season for them. They didn't play all that well, but they had a good year overall. Their player manager was a guy named J.E. Dallas, who they said was a first-class catcher, a jewel, a hustler. And he had played for several teams in Philadelphia, so he was pretty good. Another memorable player they had on that team was a guy named Gene Moriarty. Now, he only stood five foot eight and weighed 130 pounds, but he played three seasons in the major leagues. But he only got into 72 games, and he batted 152. So now you know why he's back playing in Monmouth, Illinois, right? Um, they had guys that came and played here. Uh, E.S. Burke, who came on the recommendation of Charles Comiskey. Uh, August Gus Greeley, he came from a sporting news team in St. Louis. They had John Halpin, who was from the Chicago area. Interestingly, after he left and went on to other things in life, he became a Chicago detective. Uh, Charles Wersch, who was a catcher and an infielder. And then there was a fellow named Frank Harris. Now, he, with the next guy that I'm going to mention, have a rather infamous reputation. And I, I would challenge anybody to say that they could match this. That team, the Athletics, had two guys that season that later went on to be murderers, and both of them found guilty. Frank Harris was found guilty of murder after he shot a fellow in an argument over um, uh, alcohol and a woman and allegations of gambling. He tried to brush it off and say that his bartender was the one who did it, and then he tried to plead mental uh, problems that didn't work. And he was going to be hung on uh, November 29th, 1895, but it is obviously stayed, and that's because his wealthy father-in-law, a guy named John Billerbeck, uh, knew some people and guessed the governor's office. Gee, what a surprise. In the state of Illinois, someone got off with the help of a politician, right? It goes all the way to the Illinois Supreme Court, and he's given a stay of execution. He spends time in Joliet, and then he finished the rest of his life in a mental institution. But this is the real infamous one in the bunch, Charles Pacer Smith. Uh, as a young man, he was an excellent pitcher. In fact, there's a story that he once got uh, asked to pitch in an exhibition game against Boston, the uh, National League, 
but he got the 23 to one. He bounced around to a whole series of um, minor league teams. And in this era is when he picked up his nickname Pacer. And that came from the idea that he uh, ran with the pace of a horse. Um, he married a woman named uh, Maggie Buckert, who lived in Decatur. And his rather unsavory reputation followed him. And initially, uh, her parents did not want them to get married. And you're going to see why later. When he came to Monmouth, he was already 36 years old. They nicknamed him the old man, but he was still quite a good pitcher. He was said to be cool and calculating, and he used his curves with judgment. I like that one. Uh, he then later played in some other minor leagues in the area and actually played pretty well. One year, he got a gold watch and $75 and a, a box of cigars that had been specially named for him called the Pacer Smith brand. But his problems with alcohol and his marriage, which led to a separation, he tried to stick around in baseball, ended up working as a cook and a bartender and a dog trainer, and then... On October 4th, 1895, came the shocking news that uh, everyone in Monmouth heard about. Uh, he had been involved in a shooting, and not just any shooting, he tried to kill his wife. What happened was he came back to Decatur to confront his wife. They were in the house, and uh, Smith shot at her, most likely, and he shot his child, their child, in the neck. She died within a week. He then turned the revolver on the wife, who escaped from the house, uh, his wife's teenage sister by the name of Edna Bucker, she was probably 15 or 17 at the time, ran into the family kitchen to find what was going on. Smith turned the gun on her. He shot her through the breast. She uh, managed to make her way out onto the front porch and out into the grass. At that point, uh, Maggie's father, who was a blacksmith, heard them down the street. He came. Smith confronts him in the yard, uh, doesn't shoot either one of them. Uh, Smith takes off, but they catch him rather easily later on. He's brought up in murder charges, and it's pretty obvious he's going to be found guilty. And at one point, he says, if I'm sentenced to be hanged, which I hope I will be, I hope to have it on the 16th of February. I have a reason for it. Apparently thought he was going to inherit some money. Now, I don't know what he was going to do with it after he died, because we all know you can't take it with you, right? Uh, during the trial, it said Smith was the calmest person they'd ever seen. And upon hearing the verdict, his uh, now ex-wife uh, screamed out, the slayer of my child got what he deserved. Thank God. Well, this time he didn't get off the hook. He was hung in Decatur on November 29th. Uh, one thing he did toward the end of his life, he converted to Catholicism, somehow thinking that that would help him. It obviously didn't. Uh, and we do know that at his funeral, some of his ex ball players apparently came and uh, were the pallbearers. That year, uh, they also had the interesting distinction of playing the Chicago White Stockings, which that time was a team in the National League. And they were coached and uh, managed and also helped played with by Cap Anson, one of the great um, players of that era. I don't have a box score for the game, but I do know that they beat uh, the Monmouth team 11-1, to in which uh, the Chicago team scored all 11 of their runs in the first four innings. Uh, Anson, by the way, had an incredible year. Uh, he batted 342, scored 100 runs, recorded 117 RBIs, which was fifth best in the league. And he went on to play another eight years until he was 45 years old. And he did eclipse that 3,000 hit mark. The next year, there was a team in Monmouth called the Maple Cities. And they were part of what was called the two I League for Iowa and Illinois. A guy named J.R. Hickman and E.C. Morgan were entrepreneurs. They got the league really going and uh, served in government positions. At one point early on, there was a thought that the league uh, was going to be called the CB&Q League. In fact, uh, the railroad offered $250 if they would uh, change that name. The emphasis in the league was really on uh, good play and good sportsmanship. And I found this quote. It says, ladies can attend without the slightest fear of being insulted by drunken men or having their ears offended with bad or improper language. In short, the league officials have well decided to have good ball played by gentlemen and attended by ladies and gentlemen. And then there was a later quote in the Cedar Rapids Gazette about uh, the clubs and their play. It said they would, quote, rather have a gentlemanly orderly club without a pennant than a pennant by rudeness. One thing they did say, there was no way in the world they were ever going to play games on Sunday. Baseball on the Sabbath was a real no-no for these particular people. Uh, one final interesting thing about this group is that uh, and as it was in that era, they only had one umpire per team. And one of the umpires was a guy named Charles Kirkpatrick. Now, what made him so unique? 
he was one legged. Now, I don't know how he hopped around and did this or they had a crutch or something, but he was one of the umpires and apparently one of the better ones. So who did they play that year? They played the Dubuque Giants, the Aurora Hoodoos, the Ottawa Pirates, the Joliet Convicts. That's a great one. Cedar Rapids Canaries, the Sterling Bluecoats and the Ottumwa Coal Palaces. Now, we just don't have names like te or team names like that anymore. One of the guys who they played against that year was Bud Fowler. And Fowler played with five teams in the area that year. Rather amazing. Records for what we can find show that he batted about 322 in that era, and particularly when he was at Galesburg. In one of the games, he went six for seven and scored five runs in a 31 to five blowout. Now, whether whether some of these teams knew that he was black when they assigned him is not completely clear. Uh, the Sterling Evening Gazette said of watching Fowler, they said this, our new second baseman Fowler caught the crowd by his field work and put up the finest game at second base ever seen. Fowler ran out to center field twice and took flies away from the center fielder McCann to the latter's disgust. He was so fast, he was said to run like a deer. Fowler uh, impressed a lot of people, including the president of the Dubuque team. And at one point, it said that he lamented uh, that if Fowler were only painted white, he would be playing among the best of them. Fowler, as you can probably figure, suffered from racism and prejudice. There was a time uh, when he was with Sterling that he was refused on a road trip to stay in a particular hotel. Other times he would be refused uh, dining service. Uh, but he played exceptional baseball wherever he went. In fact, a lot of these teams said that Fowler was their favorite player. At the end of that season, he worked for the Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy Railroad. And in the meantime, he also took up some of a literary career. He wrote a play called Colored Southern Aristocracy that was later actually put on by a group called the Higher Sisters. And after that season, it was said that, quote, Bud had a laudable literary ambition. And there were some thoughts that, that Fowler was, quote, so disgusted with baseball business that he thought about quitting baseball and just turned to literary pursuits. Uh, some last final thoughts about Fowler. There's no doubt about it that he was standing up against systemic racism in this era of Jim Crow. And at one point in an 1895 issue of Sporting Life, he said, quote, my skin is against me. If I had not been quite so black, I might have caught on as a Spaniard, which is something they would do in that time period or something of that kind. The race prejudice is so strong that my black skin barred me. Uh, so he's one of probably about 85 black ball players that played in that particular era. And uh, there's a Sabre article by David Catham. I hope I'm pronouncing his name right. It was entitled, Did Bud Fowler Almost Break the Major League Color Line in 1888? And I read that article. It's very extensive. And uh, the implications are that they think that he may have actually signed a contract. So years and years before uh, Jackie Robinson and some of the others, he did that. How did that year turn out in the two-wide league? Well, he finished pretty close to the top 64 to 48. The players that they had on that team included, believe it or not, eight guys that would either play in the major leagues prior to coming to the team or played afterwards. And there's a whole host of them. We don't have time to go through all of them, but I'll, I'll mention a few. Frederick William, they called him Fritz Clausen. He was a left-handed pitcher from New York. He played in the majors. William Bill uh, Wilkie Collins, he was an Irish catcher. August Gus Greeley from the St. Louis area, he was a shortstop. William Theodore Billy Crowell, a pitcher, he pitched in the major leagues for two years. Albert John Burt Inks, he was actually born with the name Inkstein. He was a left-handed pitcher, and he pitched 77 games in the majors uh, and threw over 603 innings. Um, Eugene uh, or Gene Moriarty, 5'8", 130 pounds. Uh, he's the one I told you that played in 72 games that didn't bat very well. William Bill uh, Zeiss, he was a catcher. He played with the St. Louis Browns of the American Association under Charles Comiskey. But one of the fellows that really attracted a lot of attention was a guy named Charles Leander Bumpus Jones. Uh, he was a not-so-bright kid born in Cedarville, Ohio. And uh, when he wasn't uh, working, uh, he was playing baseball, it said, for 7 to $8 a game, which was probably a lot of money in that time period. He probably had nothing better than a third or fourth grade education. But he was proving himself so well that uh, he was playing for a variety of teams. And it's said that in 1890, uh, he came with a friend who was going to attend Monmouth College. And what happened is uh, he didn't get into the college, which I'm not surprised with at all, but he decided to start pitching for the uh, Monmouth Maple Cities. 
And he started that on um, in early May. He won his first game 18 to one and he pitched through the end of May. And in that time period, he was four and two. And they did wasn't pitching very well and there were some problems. And uh, Monmouth released him. He turned around going out to Aurora and he was 12 and 10 in that time period. 1891, he pitched with uh, 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 Tumble, Iowa. And there was a little poem that they wrote about him. They said, there is a young pitcher named Bumpus who, was ra who has raised quite a considerable rumpus. But a tumble, you know, don't with him go as without him, the other clubs thump us. So he was a pretty darn good ball player. Um, in Aurora, he would kind of be up and down a little bit. He struggled some. And then in 1892, he really came into his own. At one point early in the year, his record was either 15-0 or 16-0, including six shutouts. And the story is that at one point, he'd only given up 16 runs in these 16 games. He finished the year 24-3. and three. He moved up to the Southern uh, League, and he played with a team uh, in the Atlanta area. And at one point in time, uh, they were playing an exhibition game against the Cincinnati Reds. Well, Jones came in in relief, and in the last three innings, held the Reds without a hit. So guess what happens? Uh, Charles Comiskey says he'd like him to come and pitch the very end of the season for the Cincinnati Reds. Um, he has the distinction then of being one of probably four pitchers that ever threw a no hitter in his first major league game. Uh, he was, this was against the Pittsburgh Pirates who were batting 236 at the time. The final score was three to one. The only run came on an unearned run. He only uh, walked uh, four and struck out three in that game. A Cedarville, Ohio historian who knew something of his story said that Comiskey gave him two $50 bills and a brand new suit of clothes. And the experience bump, as Jones said, filled him and made him feel like a million. Uh, in 1893, uh, now the mound is going and pitching rubber is going back to 60 feet, six inches. And he did pretty well uh, pitching in some exhibition games in the offseason. But then in one of these games, he was paint, he was beamed in the temple and he started suffering from bouts of dizziness and fainting spells. And um, he ends up getting moved the next year to the New York Giants under manager John Ward Montgomery. And in his very first game he pitches, guess who he's up against? Well, this is what you want to be. Cy Young. That's who you get a pitch against in your first game with the Giants, right? When he walks 10 guys in that game and he ends up losing. But you know what they possibly thought of him. Uh, he drops out of the majors. He goes around to another series of minor league teams, including one in Columbus, Ohio. And he's met there by a guy who apparently kind of becomes a friend and a mentor to him, a fellow who's well-known quite later for his oddball behavior. It's none less than Rue Boidel. So, so he becomes a friend apparently with Rue. Uh, and in that year, he is with Columbus 17 and six with a 145 ERA. Now, in this day and age, that gets you sent up to the major leagues pretty fast. Well, he's still stuck down in the minors. He bounces around a little bit. He's in the Western League. And eventually, by the time he's done in baseball, he's played 16 years of ball for 17 different clubs. Um, after that, because of the taste that he developed for alcohol and some other problems, um, he's basically an invalid. He becomes a cripple. And at one point, he, uh, he supposedly actually tried to take his life by slashing, slashing his throat with a razor. Uh, the Cincinnati Reds found out about his rather poor position. They actually staged an exhibition game to raise some money for him. And the last thing I'll say about Bumpus Jones is that David Catham, who wrote a 223 uh, Sabre article about him, one of the things that's always been speculated is whether he was actually black. Uh, his mother never married, and there's speculation that his father was black and that he was a mulatto, but apparently kind of light-skinned. Uh, but there's been some discussion of this going back and forth and back and forth. 1906, there was an independent team in Monmouth, and the player they really coveted was a player in the Monmouth uh, college team, a guy named Walter Pete McMillan. McMillan had pitched extremely well against other college teams in the area. At one point, he won a game against Bradley University 11-3. to And the talk was, if we could get Pete McMillan, we're going to be something. You well, know, he kind of would pitch a little bit and then have to leave and such. That year, they played a team called the uh, Cherokee Indians or the Indian roster. And uh, Monmouth beat them in a 10-inning affair, 3-2. to two. The headline was Save Scalps from Redskins. But one of the things that they did in that particular game is uh, they came back later that night. And they played, I guess, kind of a, an unusual exhibition game. Somehow, 
they illuminated the field. And uh, they played it actually in a smaller area. They played it with a rubber ball and without gloves. And they had a really good time. There was a, a Native American pitcher by the name of Cole, who was probably partly French Canadian. And it was said that Cole would entertain the fans with a wind up, a wind up that looked like a windmill getting ready to lose one of his blades. Well, what happened was he'd do this and everybody laughed. And the Mammoth pitcher started throwing like that too. The 1907 team is really the bridge to kind of the second half of all this. And it's born of a guy named John Brown. He was mayor, multi-mayor, multi-term mayor of Monmouth in that era. He was uh, educated at Monmouth College, and uh, he was in the Illinois National Guard. He became the president of the Second National Bank. Uh, he had a lot of business acumen. He, uh, he was the head of the Monmouth Plow Company, and uh, he also was involved in a lot of philanthropic affairs. His grandson, believe it or not, is still alive, and I know him quite well. His name is Bob Lafferty, and Bob and I get together about once or twice a week to get together and talk. And he told me of how he was involved in all of these organizations in town. He helped to start the Rotary, the Elks, the Knights of Pythias, the Country Club, and you name it, go on and on and on. He was a real stoic fellow. Bob told me a story once when he was a little boy. He came to the Second National Bank and he went up to his grandfather's office on the second floor. And the secretary there said he couldn't go in until his grandfather told him that it was appropriate. And apparently, this is the way Robert says, he, he let Robert set out there just to see how long he would kind of fume and say, like, well, when am I going to come in? When am I going to come in? When am I going to come in? And finally, he, he ushered them in. And he just wanted to see what kind of a nature and behavior that, that Robert or Bob, as I call him, uh, uh, would uh, would show in front of him, and it was like then he would talk to him, and that was kind of the just the the demeanor of um, him. And then it's sort of a if if you build it, they will come. He says that I have some land on South Eleventh Street, and I'll build a ballpark there. And the ballpark that they build uh, is uh, is really nice for that particular era. And he's also helped by the fact that the Rock Island Southern Railroad Company says they'll pitch in with some of the financing and they'll run tracks out to there as well. The uh, the stands are going to be 64 feet in length. Uh, there's a protective net with seven rows of seating for 300 spectators. They built four sets of bleachers down the lines, and there was an eight-foot fence that was built around the field. And this is where they're going to play from 1907 to 1913. Some of the players on that particular team uh, that gained some note, uh, again, Walter Pete McMillan, the Monmouth College pitching star, but then they had a bunch of other guys, and I love their names. Listen to these guys. William Hans Wagner, Edward Jap Wagner, Bill Mole Maloney, Jiggs Donahue, Turk Rodman. And this went on and on. Everybody had a nickname. Uh, some of these guys, I never found out their first names. There was a guy named Chaika, C-H-A-Y-K-A, Chaika. He played the outfield. Some of these guys, the newspaper would never say what their name was. They just had like a nickname or some goofy reference to them. Uh and so that was that was that team that kind of got things started in that year. They played one of these independent uh, uh, barnstorming Native American teams, the Nebraska Indians. In fact, they almost got no hit by them. They lost four to nothing on a one hit game. Then came 1908, and that was the first time that they were not an independent team. They're going to play uh, in a league. And this whole idea was, again, John Brown's idea. Uh, they want to keep Monmouth on the map. And they start what was called the Illinois Missouri League or the IM League. So who's in that league? Well, it's the Hannibal Cannibals, the Macomb Potters, the Havana Perfectos, the Canton Chinks, the Galesburg Hornets, and of course Monmouth. Their manager and uh, player manager is a guy named uh, Robert or uh, Bob Hyde, who was from the University of Nebraska. He was their manager and catcher and first baseman and kind of did a little bit of everything. So they got to come up with a name. They didn't have a name in 1907. So they put it up to a contest, and everybody sends in their votes for what should be the name of the team. You can look at some of the crazy names here, like the Hummers, the Skimmers. I wouldn't want to play for the Kittens. That just sounds not too really aggressive there. But in honor of their captain and their manager, they have the Hyde Scalpers and such. Um, the name that initially got the most votes was the Maples. that were the Maple City. After that, it was the UPs for the United Presbyterians. I would have liked that. I go to the United Presbyterian Church. But eventually I said, we really should be honoring John Brown in this whole process. And so that's what they do. They call them the Browns. Now, 
By midseason, they're right towards the top. You can see they were right below Hannibal with a 32 and 26 mark. They were playing very well. Robert Hyde, both their uh, manager and one of their players, was hitting 312 with 17 stolen bases. So they were really cooking. But then that second half, they started running into trouble. One of their best pitchers, Omer Hardgrove, who's over there on the far left, he got into a fight with a fellow player after a ball game when Hardgrove got shut out 3 nothing. Apparently, he took exception to something that was said. Uh, there was a newspaper columnist uh, by the name of Wendy in his local gossip, as he called it, uh, talked about when Monmouth was fined $50 by the league office for walking off the field on a disputed umpire's call. What really saved them that season was this guy on the far right, Paul uh, Ermsker, who was also known as Ermi in Germany and Pete, and they called him a lot of things. But what makes him unique is that he came to them as a 30-year-old. He had only started playing baseball two years earlier when he was 28 years old. But here's, here's the other fascinating thing about Ermsker. He probably ended up playing more games for the Browns than anybody else. He was very fast. The other thing that caught everybody's attention that year was a game played in Galesburg. The outgoing player manager for Galesburg was a fellow named John Grogan. And uh, as they called it a disgraceful affair, there was some jawing between the Monmouth fans and Grogan. And at one point, Grogan went into the stands to confront who was obviously jawing at him and, and heckling him. And some fisticuffs and fighting broke out. And at one point, uh, the team uh, secretary, a guy named Dredge, was pulled uh, out of this melee. And then John Brown, who I've been talking about, he was actually arrested for not, for not overseeing and not putting an end to this. But the most controversial and captivating area of all this was a guy named William Nickel. Now, he was a world-class magician. He traveled all over the world. He's called the Great Nicola. And he happened to be at the game. And whether you look at the Monmouth papers or the Galesburg papers, you kind of get a different version of this. But I like the one from the Galesburg paper better. And this is the way they described it. They said that Grogan went in into the stands after uh, the, the uh, magician. And the Galesburg skipper uh, gave him, quote, a vicious kick, full in the face without warning. A stunned Grogan then fell back. The Hornets' Penny Rossbeck came to Grogan's rescue and gave Nicola, quote, a smash to his head, causing the magician to retire from the fight. Well, they took all these guys down to the ticket office. They thought, oh, they're, they're going to they're gonna arrest Brown and Nicole and the whole batch. They hold them down there for a while. The police show up, and then that's kind of the end of things. The league investigated it, but nothing came of it. But despite all that, they didn't really have a particularly good year. They were 55 and 16 and uh, 13 games back. Then comes 1909. Well, are they going to turn things around? Well, there were a lot of controversies going on in town. One of them, was the town going to be wet or dry? Are they going to allow alcohol or not? What about all this fight for um, the right to vote uh, by women? And then uh, were they going to build a new high school or not? So all this was going on in that time period. Uh, the manager who took over was a guy named John Jack Corbett. Now, you probably never heard of him, but I'm going to tell you more about him later. One of the guys they played against that year was none other than a Grover Cleveland Alexander, this young guy who was pitching in his very first professional season. They nicknamed him Dode. And in the very first game that he pitched against Monmouth, Monmouth beat him 5-4. to four, But he struck out a lot of the uh, players for Monmouth. And it was already said they could see his talent, as they called him the Big Strawberry Slinger. I love that one. And they also noted the fact that he was blonde and ruddy, a really good-looking guy. They had short fingers, but they also said he had the build of a switch engine. Well, here comes a game against Canton. So in that game against Canton, he strikes out 10 guys and throws a no-hitter. Three days later, he throws almost another near no-no. He pitches 18 innings, strikeouts 19 guys, and wins one to nothing. So in three days, think about this, he throws a no-hitter, and he throws another game for 18 innings. So when you see those pitchers today, it's like, oh, I think I've got a little bruise on my finger or something. I'm going out after two innings. Think about those guys. Uh, they loved him. He became a big fan around the league. They called him Alexander the Great, the big strawberry slinger, and sometimes OU Alexander for like OU Alexander. Uh, but the highlight of that year was – that the Chicago Cubs, yes, the Chicago Cubs, the 1907 and 1908 world champions were coming to play Monmouth. Now, I know what you're first thinking. How in the world did that come about? Well, 
The story is that the, the owner of the Browns and their chief executive, John Brown, knew Charles Murphy of the Chicago Cubs, and they arranged for this. This was not unusual. A team was traveling on their off day. They were probably heading for St. Louis to play a ball game, and they stopped in Monmouth to play this uh, particular contest. Um, it's just amazing when you think of this, about what the Cubs were like in that era. I did a little digging. Think about this. The Cubs in four seasons won 530 games and four pennants, two World Series. And, of course, they lost the memorable 1906 World Series to the Hitless Wonders in a season when they won 116 games. They expected about 3,500 people to be there for the game. The town pretty much shut down at about 2.30 in the afternoon so everybody could go. New bleachers were built. And I honestly think also they probably put a rope around the uh, foul lines and out into the outfield to kind of squeeze every available person that would come in. As I said, the question on everybody's lips around town was, are you going to the Cubs game? Well, they did. And about 4,000 eventually filled the stands. Uh, the Cubs had actually left Chicago, get this, at 427 in the morning. They showed up in Monmouth a few hours later. It had been drizzling and damp, so they put on some dry straw and a tarp over the field, and then they rolled it before the game. A 1,000 advanced tickets had been sold for 50 cents each, which would be like about 13 bucks today. Um, and, uh, by the time they were ready to play, I'm, I'm sure the field and everything was absolutely packed and it was probably just almost pandemonium. Both teams came in really hot. Uh, the Browns came in at a 600 clip, uh, battling for first place. The clubs, the Cubs at that point were 33 games over 500. So everybody kind of had a sense that this was going to be a great ball game. Here's a picture of the, uh, by the way, the uh, season pass for the Cubs. And then to the side, you can see the uniforms that the Cubs played in that particular time. Monmouth put out a special scorecard showing the names of the players they expected to play in the game. Now, this is very common in that era. They would, like the Cubs or whoever was playing, says, well, all the starters are going to be in the game. Well, that never, ever happened. Probably the most that ever happened is they stepped out of the dugout and tipped their cap and they went back in. But look who, look who the fans of Monmouth expected to see play that day. Tinker, Evers to Chance. Okay. Three finger Mordecai Brown, these great ball players that are, they really expected all of them to come and play. Well, uh, they didn't. And of course, that was probably for the people who really knew, they knew that was not likely going to happen. Uh, only two guys who were really frontline starters for the Cubs played that day um, Circus Holly Hoffman, and you can see his picture there in the middle, and then Irv Hickenbotham, who's going to have an interesting distinction later. The fellow who they picked to pitch for the Cubs was one of their 20-year-old uh, rookies, a guy named Pat Reagan. He had just been brought over from the Reds. He only pitches in four games that day. So not surprisingly, they're not going to use one of their mainline hurlers for that. Uh, Monmouth had their own scorecard on the other side. You can see we love our Cubs, but OU Browns. And instead of like what the Cubs did, everybody that was listed here actually did get into the game. And so they were put forth a pretty good team too. So who gets to pitch for the Browns? In this particular contest, it's a guy named Conrad Bessier. He was eight and six on the year. Now, they had two other guys that were very good pitchers that year. Omer Hardgrove was 27 and nine, and Charles Delaire was 21 and 14. But they're battling for first place uh, in their league as well. They don't want to use their best guy initially. And so they send Bessier out, and he actually did pretty, he did pretty well. Uh, he'd been pitching uh, uh, pretty sharp baseball at that point. So the Cubs enter the field somewhere around 2 o'clock. They warm up. No indication they took batting practice or anything other than that. Um, and one very unique distinction, probably for the, only the first time in U.S. history, a United States post office was closed so the people who worked there could go to an exhibition baseball game. I don't think that ever happened before. Uh, the game was going to start at 3 o'clock. The fellow who had been brought down from Chicago to cover the game for the Chicago fans was a guy named Charles Dryden. Now, you may have never heard Charles Dryden. He's from Monmouth, Illinois, and you can see it his tombstone there. He's called the Dean of the Sports Writers. But I know you've heard this. The Washington Senators were the first in war, first in peace, and last in the American League. You've heard that one, right? Okay. He also is the guy who called Charles Comiskey the old Roman. He was known for what were called these Drydenisms. He described the coming of the game in Monmouth as a terrific battle was, was expected. Um, but he also had some disparaging things to say about the Cubs. He called them the Chicago subs. Uh, he knew that they were not going to play a full game at that point. So who gets into the game? I mentioned Sully Hoffman and Irv Higginbotham. And believe it or not, 
the Browns actually jumped out first. They were ahead one to nothing. And then after a series of errors, um, the Cubs took the lead four to one. And then came up Eddie Brown, who was our shortstop. Well, as it was said, he really soaked the spheroid and hit a home run against the Cub pitching. So now the score is four to two. They bring in, the Cubs do, they bring in a middle reliever by the name of Rip, Rip Eggerman. He was four and four with a 182 ERA in the year. He was, as it was said, was a real puzzle for the Browns hitters. And then finally, to finish up the game, they bring in Irv Hickenbotham. Now, he was five and two that year with a 219 ERA. Uh, he was described as a, a rangy speed merchant and did a fine job, as they said, of big lead twirling. Um, the other fellow who got some recognition in that game, besides um, uh, Edward Brown, was uh, Hub Hart. And uh, uh, he uh, really moved into the limelight, as it said. He threw out three Cub base dealers with, as they said, perfect pegs. And they were really marveling at Hart's wing as he, at one point, threw a guy off base that had wandered away about 10 feet. Charles Dallaire, one of their starters, actually finished up the game, and uh, he pitched the final innings with what was called an 18-carat variety. So think about this. The Chicago Cubs, all these years of champions, managed to only beat the Monmouth Browns 4-2. to two. Now, that's when, like, when they would usually go out on these barnstorming tours, and the Cubs would just kill anybody they played. Uh, in one particular game I found against the Macomb team, they won six to nothing. But usually what happened is there was enough guys they'd start out and pitch, like they'd play the first six innings or so, and then they'd be out and they just, you know, the real scrubs came on. Uh, Charles Dryden said of the game that, uh, uh, that both teams played very admirably, uh, but he also said of the Browns, with steady work, they could have given the Cubs a lively tussle to win. And if they'd only been more lucky thinking of those errors they played, they might have actually turned out the winner. Uh, and uh, uh, Dryden, by the end, observed that uh, that the Cubs as well felt that they were they were well treated in the process. So 1909, with as well as they played, not surprisingly, they won the um, the uh, um, the Il uh, I am League, the Illinois Missouri League. One of the uh, real stars of that uh, team that year was Gus Williams, who's later going to go on and play for the St. Louis Browns. Uh, also, Delaire and Hart got a lot of look from some scouts in that particular time period. So uh, when you think about it and think about that team, they had guys that would eventually end up playing in the higher minor leagues. Some of these guys went to the majors. Jose Siner played with the Boston Doves, uh, become, became the Braves. Uh, Gus Williams, I told you, played for the St. Louis Browns. Uh, Omar Hargrove probably should have ended up in the major leagues at some point in time. Delaire that year pitched 381 innings. Uh, Will Johnson batted three, 530 times and hit seven home runs. It was probably a, one of the tops in the league. And I told you about Paul Ermster later. He was extremely fast. I have no idea how many bases he stole, but I bet it was a lot. But the guy who got the most credit for his great game was Walter Hub Hart. He was called up and asked to be a bullpen pitcher for the Cubs in a series that they played at the end of the year between the White Sox. The White Sox, by the way, won that series two games to one. And in one of the games, they actually brought Hart in, and Hart got to catch against uh, the Chicago Cubs pitcher. So with all that said, they decide they're going to move up. The next year, they're going to move on to the Central Association, where they're going to play the Quincy Vets, the Hannibal Cannibals, the Ottumwa Packers, the Keokuk Indians, the Burlington Pathfinders, the Galesburg Pavers, and the Kiwani Boilermakers. The guy who they picked to lead them that year was a fellow named Lou Drill, Lou Drill had major league experience with the Tigers and the Senators. He'd been a catcher, but he wanted to be a judge up in Minnesota. He had that kind of training, and he, this was the deal. He said, if I get elected for this judgeship up in Minnesota, I'm going to obviously stay up there. I'm going to make a lot more money, uh, but you're going to need somebody else to uh, take my place. So another ex-major leaguer by the name of Emerson Pink Holly, who had a twin, by the way, called Blue. So Blue and Pink, get it right? Uh, he uh, leads the team in those early practices in the first games of the year. And then as it turns out, uh, Drill loses the election and he comes and he takes over the team. The Cubs decide they're going to come back in 1910. And uh, this time with Irv Higginbotham on the team. Now, uh, it's kind of hard to say exactly why Higginbotham goes all the way from the Chicago Cubs to the Monmouth Browns. He was 5-2 and two with a, a 218 ERA. But here's what I'm thinking, and from what I've talked to a few people, I think he 
basically ticked off Charles Murphy. And Murphy was going to teach him a lesson by sending down as far as he could go. You like pitching in Monmouth last year? Guess what? That's where you're going. He had one stop along the way before he hit uh, Monmouth. Um, Jason Cannon, who was at the 2023 uh, Sabre Convention, I chatted with him about the book he wrote about Charlie Murphy. And he said of that Irish immigrant Murphy, he said that he was always having troubles with players who, ever, who forever wanted more lucrative contracts. And so that's probably partly what happened. So in 1910, they're going to play the Cubs again. The Cubs will win 104 uh, games that particular season. Uh, they come in early in the day like they did before. But this time, instead of having 4,000 fans, only about 1,000 people show up to watch the game. Now, it's not weather, but it's kind of an odd coincidence. The Browns had already scheduled a game earlier in the day as part of their league against Hannibal, and they beat Hannibal 6-2, to probably a seven-inning game. Well, then the thought was that the fans thought that, okay, well, now we're going to see the Cubs play. Well, no, it's like a split double header day. No, you got to leave. You got to pay another 50 cents to come in and see them play the Cubs. Well, think about how many of those people saw the Cubs a year earlier. Well, I'm not going to pay another 50 cents to come in and see them. And I don't know, it was getting hot in the day or whatever the case was. So they only had about a thousand people there to watch the Cubs, which is just what the Browns might have had on like a really good day or uh, ordinarily. Frank Chance, who was the manager and player manager of the Cubs at the time, he decided he didn't even want to play in the game. He ended up going fishing out at a place called um, the uh, Iowa Central Railroad Pond. Today we call it Citizens Lake. So he didn't even get in there to tip his hat. Uh, but this time, because they had played so close in 1909, well, the Cubs aren't taking any chances. And about eight of their regulars get into this game. I mean, they're not playing games this time. You were not going to get beat by these Mammoth Browns. That'd be embarrassing. And partly why? Because who's pitching for the Mammoth Browns? Irv Higginbottom. Now, they know Hig. They still like him and everything. Uh, Hig comes out, pitches pretty well early on. And then, unfortunately, he gives up a series of about three runs. And so here's pictures of those guys. You can see Evers and Ludris and Schulte and Seinfeld. Uh, Zimmerman and Crow and McIntyre, these guys all play. Uh, and Monmouth has some of their regulars from that 1909 game as well. Uh, I talked to you earlier about Gus Williams and Will Johnson, Jose Steiner, Paul Ermsker. And so they're in the game, and, and they think they got a chance to win this particular game. In fact, they jump out one to nothing in this game. The Cubs come back, and uh, one of the runs that helps them to, uh, to bypass the Browns at that point was Harry uh, Steinfeld. He'd only hit two home runs the rest of the year. He hit one against the, uh, the Browns. Um, then some other runs were scored. And so it's four to three Cubs. Well, then comes uh, the next inning. I'm going to jump over that one. Okay. And uh, who comes up to pitch against the Browns? It's a guy by the name of Jack Feaster. And they called him the giant killer. So he comes in. And what happens? Well, Loomy Gus Williams, one of his other nicknames, it's a home run. The Browns are now leading uh, uh, at this point of four to three. I think I messed up with the score earlier. It's four to three. They go ahead. Um, the Cubs uh, lead uh, Pfeiffer, uh, Pfeffer in the game at that point. They've got runners on in the eighth. They can't score. They've got runners on in the ninth. And uh, with runners in scoring position in the ninth inning with one out with a chance to tie the game and to take the lead, Two pop-ups, and the game is over. The Cubs win a five to four with eight of the regulars in the game. Now they may have just having a bad game and not real playing very well, but I'm sure that really didn't set very well for them. But it certainly set well with the quote "never die Browns." So let's wrap up that particular season then. So the Browns were said to be playing continually uh, classy ball. They were honored for having treated the uh, the Cubs so well. And they did get a chance to play against a team that went to the World Series once more. They played against the Athletics. That's the Cubs. And uh, they lost that one four to one. But in the offseason, Charles Kaminsky of the White Sox says, guess what? How would you like to play uh, an exhibition game with us? The only problem is he wants to play it in April. So unfortunately, the Browns say, well, we'd love to, but we can't. 1911, they bring in Claude Stark to be the manager. And this is not particularly the best year from them. Um Stark had been a player up at the 3I League, a higher league, and he did sign some fairly good players. And they tried to get some of the regulars back, but it just didn't go as well as they wanted. The big controversy that year, however, was whether they were going to play on Sunday or not. Now, remember years earlier, Mama said there's no way in the world 
we're going to play on Sunday. That's just immoral. But by now, a lot of the other teams are playing on Sundays. And basically, the league tells Mammoth, well, here's the deal. You're going to play on Sunday or you're probably out of the league because we need that money. Well, there's a big meeting held in Monmouth, and uh, they're going to institute these so-called blue law legislations. There's a Sabbath Reform Bureau, the Sabbath Union, and all of these are joined together. And there's ministers giving speeches with things like, what would Christ find if he came to Monmouth? Well, oh, not finding baseball, I hope. But they're going to play quite a schedule that year. Get this, 131 games in 126 days. That means they've got to play double headers, and they, by God, have got to play on Sunday. So there's a meeting in the Methodist Church led by Dr. John Burnett, and uh, he's the leader there from the Monmouth Ministerial Association. He said that baseball on Sunday would, quote, encourage and foster a spirit of anarchy, threatening the very bulwark of our civilization. Uh, that It's just wrong to play on God's holy day. Francis Scott McBride of the Ninth Avenue United Presbyterian Church He's also the head of the Anti-Union League. Well, he wants nothing to do with Sunday baseball. The Mama School Superintendent, Charles Joyner, said that playing baseball on Sunday would be demoralizing to young men. So then we turn to the guy here in the picture. That's Mama's College President, T.H. McMichael, who was called a friend of baseball. He pitched for Mama's College in his younger days. But he is also a staunch Presbyterian clergyman. And he says that Sunday baseball would have demoralizing influences in both the city and the college. Keep in mind that the time that McMichael was president of Monmouth College, they did not allow card playing, and there were no formal dances at Monmouth College until 1930. Um, so the thought is that, um, you know, that, you know, hey, if they don't play on Sunday, they're withdrawing, but that's certainly okay with them. So what's the outcome? Well, the Monmouth Baseball Association meets. Everybody's with bated breath finding out what's going to happen. Nothing really comes out. They don't know what's going on. Are John Brown and the directors trying to cover things up? Is the league forcing them into their hand? Well, when the schedule finally comes out, you know what happened. They're going to play on Sunday. And so the issue was, is it morality or money? Money won out. Claude Stark is the manager of that uh, team that year. Uh, they bring a few of the old guys back, hoping they're going to do better, but not, for the most part, too much better. Uh, and in fact, they finished 59 and 69, 28 games out of first place. So now we're up to 1912, two years left. There were two controversies, one involving the guy who I talked about this picture first. And that was uh, uh, Welch, as you can see, but his real name was Harry Welch. He was actually already signed to another team. And the thought was he was breaking his contract. And then the other big issue was drinking. Remember, we had just had this big fight over playing baseball on Sunday. Well, now we're going to have a big fight because every two years in the state of Illinois, uh, townships and communities got to vote on whether they were going to be wet or dry and allow alcohol or not. Well, a lot of these same moralists that opposed baseball did not want anything to do with drinking in Monmouth. They formed anti saloon leagues. There was the temperance speakers of that particular era. And while John Brown tried to kind of maintain a middle course in all of this, um, he, uh, he actually uh, vetoed when he was still mayor two ordinances. One was going to impose a fine of $25 to $200 for the illegal sale of spiritus, venice, or malt liquors. And then there was a $50 license placed on any druggist who wanted to sell liquor for medicinal purposes. Uh, Brown said he was only trying to be fair to the entrepreneurial spirit of the community in that era. But the anti-saloon leagues and the people wanted nothing to do with it. Uh, they talked about the corrosive influence of alcohol upon marriages, the harmful impact that inebriated or hungover laborers would have for local merchants and and uh, factory owners. And uh, they said they wanted the spout shut off. That was that was one of their logos. John Burnett, who'd been involved with the Sunday baseball fiasco, calls them out and says, this is where it has to stop. Well, just like the case of Monmouth baseball, what happens? The Wets win by 87 votes. So there's going to be drinking in Monmouth. Now, if I had some time, I'd tell you all the shenanigans that those yeah, those people who oppose drinking tried to put in place to stop. And by the way, 20 new saloons still put up in Monmouth that year. So uh, good for drinkers, right? Uh, the Browns finished pretty well that year, 71 and 55, brought in 18,000 people. And so that led to the final season, 1913. And there was a lot of optimism at the beginning of the year. They were going to get uh, Red Welch back. Now they're calling him Red. And they had some other really good ball players. But they were really plagued by bad weather. May was awful. 
They were constantly being rained out. And it was cold and it was chilly and it was miserable. And they weren't happy with their play and they were playing terrible. And finally, it came to the point where they had to hold a booster's day and say, look, we're not making any money. If we want to keep Monmouth on the map, we got to raise some cash because we're not making any money at the turnstiles. In fact, the directors got together and basically castigated a lot of the, as they called them, the distractors or the knockers and said, this is just not the Monmouth way. Monmouth will stay in this league. We are not going to drop out. By the midway point in the season, they're in last place. Almost every statistical category, they're losing. Uh, team president John Brown pulls everybody together. He says, we've, we've got to rally. We've got to do this. The, the uh, president of the league, a guy named Justice, comes to town and uh, basically issues a vague warning that either you get your act together or you're done now. Uh, take off the rose-colored glasses and kind of a come-to-Jesus moment. He says, Iowa City, Galesburg, and Clinton all want to take over your team right now. Well, the Browns start playing better. They got two pitchers that play pretty well in that time period. They get up to 500. And eventually, they come pretty close to meeting the 25,000 quota for what they're supposed to have for fans for that year. And here is uh, that red Welch again that I mentioned. And here was the season end. Uh, they finished pretty well, two games over 500, considering how badly they were playing early on, only eight games out of first place. Um, most of the people didn't think initially that this really would mamas, would be Mamas last year, that they would hold on and they would put another team, but it never happened. So here's all the records in those years from 1908 to 1913. Their best year was, I mentioned earlier, 1909. They were 77-50. That was the first time they played the Cubs, and they almost won 4-2. to two. 1910, they finished sixth place, but that's when they almost beat the Cubs in that five to four game. So there were a lot of people that had some good feelings for what happened. They they praised John Brown for all the effort he put into it. And in this last year, by the way, probably one of the reasons they eventually dropped out is his health was failing. He probably just couldn't be the leader of the club anymore. So closing here, what do we say about the uh, the legacy of the Browns? Well, for one thing, they had a lot of guys on these teams, and particularly the Browns, that either played in the major leagues before they came or afterwards. Moxie Mexel, uh, Moxie Mexel was, was one of these guys. He um, played one season with the Cleveland Naps, and uh, he played along rookie, uh, a guy named Shoeless Joe Jackson. You've probably heard of before. He also played alongside Cy Young. Uh, Dutch Schleibner played for the Brooklyn Robins, later the Dodgers. I talked about Siner already and, and Lumi Gus Williams. Uh, Dad Clark played for the Chicago Orphans. Lou Drill, we talked about him, played for a variety of teams as a catcher. Hickenbotham, he was one of the pitch. But then the, the guy who I imagine you probably don't know anything about, and really there ought to be a movie about this guy. His name was John Jack Corbett. Here's three things, or excuse me, four things about him you should know real quick. One, he was a manager uh, in Asheville, North Carolina. And during that time, he boarded with a family by the name of Wolf. Uh, they had a little boy who became the Bat Boy, and his name, Thomas Wolfe, the famous novelist. Later on, Wolfe wrote a story uh, called You Can't Go Home Again, and in the in the story is a guy named Nebraska Crane, and that's pretty much said that that's, that's Corbett. Uh, on October th or August 30th, 1916, he manages the shortest game in, in professional baseball history, 31 minutes. What happens is they, they agree – that uh, both teams are going to go up, they're going to swing at the first pitch every single time. If you hit it, you're going to run until you're either tagged out or you score. They both need to get on trains. In the 1940s, he tries to start a rival uh, league with the help of Mexican players. He's sued as a part of an antitrust case that goes all the way to the United States Supreme Court where he loses there. And then in the 1980s, or excuse me, 1960s, as an 80-year-old, he tries to start a rival NFL league with, of all people, Branch Rickey, okay? This could be called the Global League. Never gets off the ground. So, all in all, when we talk about the Browns, they existed from 1907 to 1913. And uh, for the most part, we can say that their legacy and their history here is a, is a strong one. It was a pleasant diversion for the hardworking uh, factory employees and clerks, various professionals and area youth. And a lot of people came out to cheer the Browns. When you think about it, I mean, what team can boast twice playing the Chicago Cubs and almost beating them? So I'll close with these two pictures here. This is from when they had these parades at the beginning of the season. So you can see all the Model Ts going around the square, the players in the back of the car. The other thing I want to point out about this is look at all the horse-drawn carriages. 
kind of gives you a framework for what time this was going on. So the Browns were worthy of baseball they played, worthy of their talent, and worthy of the financial support. Monmouth would never have another organized team like this. They had factory teams probably through the 30s and 40s and 50s, and that was it. So I will close with that. Questions that you might have. Okay. I guess we're all good. Oh. I, won't, I won't ask. I, I got a feeling I heard my wife say something earlier. Uh, did the Hawkeyes lose? Oh, they're still playing? What's the score? Oh, I was Eight. winning. 84 they're up, 74. They're up 10. Oh. with oh, uh, right. And Angel oh, Reese God. just fouled out on a charge. Oh. Waving goodbye. Sorry. Oh, I hated to hear that. I hated to hear that, <laughs> Jeff. That's terrible. I'm doing my best oh, wow. to pay attention to both. <laughs> well, here's the thing. I'm going to finish up the final little edits and proofreading the next couple of days. It's going to go off to the publisher. Uh, it's called Gorham Publishing. It's an independent company. And the reason I went the uh, self-publishing route, a friend of mine who's an author said, uh, when I told her all about the book, she said, Here, here's the deal. She said, all that stuff you have about local history and everything, she goes, they're going to cut that out with a knife. She says, all they're going to want is baseball stuff. And I said, there's so much that I've got in the book about local history. Everything from there was a mass murder in town to a guy called the corset thief who was breaking into women's homes and stealing their underwear. And I, I mean, just all kinds of things went on and on and on. And I, and I knew that I want to sell this book to not just baseball fans, but to Monmouth and, and area fans. They're going to love a lot of those things. And so um, uh, it's, it's going to be lengthy. The appendix um, I mean, I tried to literally track down every single guy who ever played baseball in Monmouth. I have hundreds of names and biographies for as many guys as I could. Um, and I have to tell you this. I want to thank Sabre so much because uh, I, I've gotten so much from some things I've looked through for Sabre. Coming to the convention last year was, was a treat of a lifetime. Uh, you know, so many of you are so skilled and so knowledgeable at what you did. And uh, it really inspired me to, to produce, you know, the best book that I could. And uh, it's something that I've been working on for roughly seven years now, and now it's coming to fruition. So thanks. Thanks to everyone uh, for listening. Uh, when it all comes about, I will let everybody know how they can get a copy. And uh, my hope was that I'd have it all, all this done. So when we met in uh, April, I could bring books to the game, but probably I'll, I'll bring some or we'll do something to a meeting somewhere in the middle of the year. So uh, I want to thank you for uh, sticking around with me uh, and uh, hearing this. So so thank you so much for everything. Uh, have a good evening. And I look questions? forward to seeing. Yeah, Can any questions? Question? Yeah, I no, question. Yeah, question? Go ahead, Bob. I'll let you go first. Okay, I just wanted to. It's a great, a great job. Uh, great job there, Tom. Oh, and, Bob, you're there. Okay. Uh, it's a fantastic thing. And, you know, what, you know, I'm sort of prejudiced, but I think what, baseball history especially early baseball needs more than anything else mm -hmm. is about 200 tom best to go out and look at these teams in small places how they were playing the game who was playing the game for them mm -hmm. you know we got we got all we need about the chicago cubs and the right. chicago white Sox. we don't yep. know anything about mama until you come came along and so yeah when, when you please let saber or let us know when it comes out, where it's available, if it's yep. on Amazon, all that sort of stuff. I mean, there's there's lots of things I could talk to you about, ask you. I, I really like you picked up on that connection between the 11th Street ballpark and transportation. Mm -hmm. That's happening all over the place. And yeah, and, oh and yeah, streetcar leagues. Yep. Yeah, we we overlook that yep. because we don't we don't think of streetcars in baseball when they're they're like that. You know, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And yeah, I have to say this job. too. Great job. Thank you, Bob. I have to say this too. I. I bring up a number of muffin games throughout the book. And my favorite one was between the corpulence and the fats. And like they got like everybody to be in the game, you had to be over 200 pounds and over 200 pounds then would be like over 300 pounds today. <laughs> and they even, they had a, they had a rule in the game. If you hit the ball, you could have a pinch runner who ran between home plate and first because I didn't think they could make it. And they were usually fundraisers. They'd raise money for various causes. But I've got stories in the book about, you know, the main streets against the broadways and the, and the clerks against the cigar, cigar makers and stuff. And these were very popular. And those muffin games were, were like the highlights sometimes of the year. And thank you again for clarifying and 
and helped me to see clear about, about the Clippers and the whole issue of the juniors and the seniors and all of that. The hard thing is sometimes to know, I'm sure they played senior teams, and that's what I wonder about that team of the, of the Rockford Forest Cities. I never hear them call a junior or a senior team, but the guys on the team were in their middle to late teens, so it may have just been like a world-class junior team or at least some kind of a hybrid between the two. So, but thank you for everything you did. I, I know when I read your book and I thought through it, it kind of constantly inspired me to say, well, God, how did he find that? Okay, well, I got to do some more digging. So, and Tom, my question, yep. my question's real brief. Just are you doing an initial run or how does that happen with the publisher? Well, I, I think I got to talk to the publishers again this week and I'm probably looking at either a hundred or 150 copies. Right. And I've got about four different places that are going to let me do a book signing. And uh, I'm sure I can sell a lot of them here in town. And I have about 20 friends and such that I promise I said, you're, you're not buying the book. I'm giving you one. And then I'm hoping to uh, give them to area libraries and historical societies and things. Because so many of these games involve other teams and other towns. And hopefully, right. like Bob was saying, it'll inspire somebody to say, God, I didn't even know. You know, who are these Hannibal cannibals, for God's sakes? Who in the <laughs> world has, how in the world has no one ever written a book? about the Hannibal Cannibals. And some of these other teams just have wonderful nicknames and things. Or like the Joliet Convicts. Has anyone ever written a book on the Joliet Convicts? How in the world did that escape uh, the attention? Uh, but I promised my wife, I'm not gonna be the one to do it. I, I need to take some time off after all this. We've got some traveling to do and I wanna take in more ball games. So, uh, so thank well, you. Well, this anybody, was wonderful, thank you. Anybody else got another question? Yeah. I. I like to ask one. Uh, one of the noteworthy sure. things I thought in Bob Sampson's book was the connection between not just the interurbans to get fans from the town yes. out to the ballpark, mm -hmm. but also the railroad connection Absolutely. to tie the towns to each other. Yep. And I, I, I don't know. I don't think I've ever been to Monmouth. Uh, mm -hmm. What railroad connections did Monmouth have? One probably going to Burlington, Iowa, which is nearby, yeah. and maybe Gettysburg, yep. but where else maybe? Yep. The Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy, it was the main railroad, and that had branch okay. lines going everywhere. And then they had links further south. So probably the Cubs came in on the CB and Q, and then they took another line down south to St. Louis in that time period. But you're absolutely right. In fact, if you remember, I told you one point when they were putting one of the leagues together, the CB and Q wanted to give the league two hundred and fifty dollars to call it the Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy lines. Okay. Uh, the railroad gave uh, money to Monmouth. They built rail lines, those interurbans out there. Uh, one of the interurbans that ran back and forth between Galesburg, believe it or not, was still running in the 1950s. Uh, it, it was known as the Rocky Doodle because it would kind of rock back and forth. And they could get from, believe it or not, they could get from Monmouth to Galesburg in about the same time today that would take you to drive to Galesburg. Okay. Uh, probably about 20 to 30 minutes. And so the fans were constantly going back and forth and back and forth. Um, probably like a lot of cities, you know, when, when, Automobile driving just became the thing. Uh, that's when a lot of those lines were taken out. But a few years ago, they were doing some digging on the streets in Monmouth. And when they pulled up some of the asphalt and stuff, of course, what did they find below? They found the, the, the old rail lines from the inner urban. Yeah. So you're absolutely right. And that's a lot in this book. There's a lot of connections to social and economic development. And as I said in the beginning, you know, it started out as just, you know, boys wanting to play baseball. And by the time they were done, it's an economic play. I mean, look, what they hear recently, they say the Chicago Cubs are worth $5 billion, you know? So, you know, it became an economic driver in a lot of these communities. Um, to have a team was, you know, the pinnacle for you. And to lose a team, you know, was like a death knell. Well, in that regard, uh, mm -hmm. if if Monmouth, uh, the team disbanded in about 1913, mm -hmm. how about the other teams that were otherwise similarly situated? We're in the same league. Yep. Uh, That's uh, Canton, a great question. Burlington and so forth. Did, did they continue to oh, play no. for Burling a couple decades? Yeah, Burlington continued. Also? Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry for interrupting. Not yeah, Burlington all. continued. In fact, they're one of the oldest continuing franchises. They just recently lost their, their uh, connection to the Midwest League. They're now in the Prospect League that team of college kids, but they go all the way back to the late 1800s, a continuous run. Okay. Uh, at one point in time, they were the pathfinders. They were the babies and all kinds of names. Um, but uh, what, what killed off a lot of these teams, not surprisingly was world war one. Uh, when world war one came about so many of those young men got drafted and went into the service and it just, 
well, you know what the implications of that war sure. was. A lot of them came back. They well, didn't have it in their souls to come back and always play baseball, unlike what happened after World War II. Um, in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s, what Mammoth had was a lot of company teams. Like, there was a stoneware company here. So I've got pictures of the stoneware teams and things like that. Some of these were pretty darn good ball players. Um, I even remember uh, Marshalltown, Iowa had a team called the Marshalltown Ansons. And I remember them playing as a small boy. Uh, and uh, so this is into the 1960s. There's there's a team like that. So I think most of them were long gone by the 60s, but there was few. But but uh, uh, so many of these teams bounce back and forth and bounce and forth. And and uh, but uh, but you're right. Uh, you know, from the standpoint that, you know, they wanted to continue and they wanted to make a name for themselves. But in many cases, uh, I think it was in the 1890 year, the total league profit for the two eyed league was $13.36. I and mean, that's how much the league made by the time everything was over. They didn't have all the marketing and everything. I didn't have any TV contracts to sign, uh, you know, with that. And uh, the marketing and things was, was very minimal. So any other Thank questions? You. Okay. Well, I was just like going to say outstanding oh, job, Tom. I, I was just going to say it's an outstanding job because it's. Uh, Thank you. I, I I definitely come from that perspective of it's so important to capture this history because it's you're able to tell the stories because the comment earlier on that you know there have been so many books written about Hall of Famers and yeah. major league teams and and very big picture in the legends and there are so many people that played the game that just never made it or reached a certain point and, mm -hmm. and nobody's been able to really capture their stories. Yeah. And I think it's so important for books like this to do that. And it's a way to sort of preserve all of that, even if it's in a extremely hyper local right. environment you're talking about. So it's mm -hmm. like, I, I, I can't wait for this book to come out. I know we had a chance to uh, mm -hmm. back at the convention, talk about it. And I've been really excited about when the day that this book is coming out. So, well, and thank you. You've been a real uh, guide and mentor and through a lot of this process. I, I always keep thinking, as I told my wife earlier, I said, you know, part of this is I, I've got to finish. I've got to do it because I just feel like I can't let people down. I've said so much and, you know, tried to develop <laughs> so much. Um, I'll mention one guy, that, you know, you were talking about some of these kind of the unsung heroes, Omer Hargrove. Omer Hargrove had a stellar minor league career, and he got as high as AAA, what would be like AAA Indianapolis. And one account was that he may have been brought up um, to Cleveland. Uh, and as often happened in the area, you've probably heard stories of this, guys that got brought up and then sat on the bench. I mean, for weeks, never got into a ball game. It's like, well, it's kind of like, you know, the, the, the famous uh, movie, um, The Natural, and like they bring they bring Robert Redford up and it says, you know, well, you know, they can sign you. But, you know, the manager says, I'm going to you know, you're going to sit here on the bench and you're not going to do a damn thing. And then, of course, then the famous batting practice scene where, you know, he gets the home run. It's like, OK, he's playing. Right. But, <laughs> but Hargrove, Hargrove was one of those guys. And there's a bunch of other guys like that. And, you know, the stories of some of these guys like Paul Ermsker. Paul Ermsker, he he joins the team when he's 30 years old. He doesn't start playing baseball until he's 28 years old. Right. <laughs> what was he doing for all those years? And he plays in probably more games than anybody else for the Monmouth Browns. It's his speed. He's quick still at 30 years old. And uh, but uh, uh, that that scorecard I showed you there is from a good friend by the name of Milo Sprout. And I was giving a presentation, and Milo walks up to me and he goes, "You got to see this." I'm looking. I'm going, "What is this, Milo?" And he's he goes, this is my great, great grandfather. He was at the Cubs Browns game. Uh, mm -hmm. And I just like, oh my God, I practically had tears in my eyes thinking about what this was. Yeah. Uh, but uh, but that's it. Here, I want to show you one last thing before I go here, just a second. Remember that picture I showed you, the ball player? Bill uh -huh. Anderson, my friend that that uh, originally turned me on to this, let me know. Bill recently died of a heart attack. He was in his early 60s. And wow. um, his mother is in charge. Bill has one of the most incredible collections of minor league postcards and pictures that you could even imagine. I'm sure they're just worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. Uh, and one of my friends was over there the other day. 
and he and he comes and knocks on me do my door and he says i have something for you tom and i said what is it and he says bill's mom wanted you to have this wow so gave me that that card i don't know much about him uh well i shouldn't say that i i know a lot about about what he did in baseball but i didn't find it one of the things i'm trying to do is trying to find where he's buried that's still kind of a mystery but wow. uh but thanks, thanks to book like books like Bob. I hope there's a lot more writing like this. Um, and uh, oh, oh, yeah, my wife tells me ninety four to eighty seven. I'll have to watch the highlights later. So it's a double <laughs> victory tonight. So, well, I'm looking forward to seeing all of you uh, that night in Peoria. I'm hoping to maybe bring one other friend along with me. And I'm constantly talking up Saber and saying you need to join if you're a baseball fan. Saber, as I kind of said, Saber is the pinnacle of organizations for people that love baseball. And I know not everybody's into all the the Saber metrics and all that and the scores, but a lot of them love the history and they love the fellowship. Um, and uh, you guys have made that possible. So, thank you for organizing this and putting this together. Well, thank you, Tom. Thank you. Thanks for being our guest. I'll see again. everyone uh, Saturday. Tom can mention Peoria. Yep. Saturday, April 13th, mm -hmm. we're going to be in the skybox for the Chiefs game. So yep. anyone who's interested, uh, please let me know. Uh, you yep. can email me. It should have been, you should have all received an email. Or call I me rush or on those books, Tom. Yeah. And then we're yeah. actually, we'll also be in normal in July, Tom. So if you have That's right. Well, that, then that, yeah. that can happen. That can happen. Yeah. I will have the <laughs> books for us. I'll bring some, I'll bring some to the, uh, to the game in Bloomington normal. In fact, they got a hold of me not too long ago. Somebody called me from Bloomington Normal, wanted to know if I won season tickets or something. And I told them, I said, well, I'll probably only be over there a couple of times. And I mentioned Saber and things, and they do something about it. So that was good. So, we yeah, have, I'm so looking. Four weeks from today, we have our, our Zoom with the Prospect League Commissioner. Yes. Oh, I'm yes. fast. I, I absolutely want to talk to him about that. That is great. I love Prospect League games. If you've not been to a Prospect League game, you got to go. They're college kids. They love it. They're playing with all their heart and soul, and it's the way baseball should be. And and uh, it's the Burley. So they're still the Burlington Bees. They had some great guys last year. That excellent Iowa Hawkeye team. They had some kids. It's kids that Iowa yeah. Hawkeye team. So we're looking forward. I'm to I'm going that. to Clinton too. So yeah. Yeah. Oh, Clinton. Oh, we go up to Clinton. We love going yeah. to Clinton. It's yep. it's got the historic stadium still. It is, and and yeah. you got to order the garbage pail. You know what the garbage pail is? <laughs> no. All the leftovers yep. from the night before get put on a plate <laughs> and like they have a prize for it. You can get everything from warmed up onion rings to to corn dogs, you name it. And my sons and I get it every time we go. The health department's dream. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's it's great. We love it. We wow. love going to Clinton. That's my second favorite ballpark after Burlington. So awesome. Yep. Yep. Well, thank you so much. Right. Awesome. Well, thank you. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, everyone, for right. joining us. It's fantastic. So yeah. Thank Hopefully you guys. We'll see you all a week from Saturday. And Iowa won, just for those on the edge. I heard that. I saw <laughs> yeah. the score. Yeah. All right.